Hey everyone, it's Denise Brown from the Caregiving Years Training Academy. Welcome to What's Your Caregiving Impact? It's a regular meeting that I hold to really talk out what's possible in terms of how can you help family caregivers because of your passion, your experience, and or both. So I'm grateful to have some participants with me today. So we're going to have some interactive portions of today's meeting, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the different training programs that I offer that can help based on the impact you want to create. So a little bit about me, I started working with family caregivers in 1990. I launched a website called caregiving.com in 1996, which I managed for 24 years. I had started developing training programs in 2016. So it was a little tough for me to do both. So I sold the community to focus on training and leadership development opportunities. I currently help my dad. I've been helping my dad since 2004, and I helped my mom for seven years until her death in 2022. Okay, so something I like to do anytime there's a particular focus for a meeting, like today's meeting, is to check the definition of the word I'm using. So here it is. The definition of impact is to inspire change. And when we were going through the introductions prior to the recording of our meeting, you all talked about how you want to help family caregivers and care partners. And you want to help them by making their experience better. So the change you want to inspire is a better experience, an easier way to find help, an easier referral to programs that could be of assistance. You want to change the caregiving experience by making it easier. And we know that it's really hard. And so there's a lot to change about the family caregiving experience, which is really what we talk about today, because it's so big in terms of what needs to change to get specific can help you feel like it's doable. If you get too broad, then you think, but where do we start? If you get specific, then you think, I know where to start. So here are some suggestions for you in terms of how specific you could get. So if you think about what you want to change that could improve the caregiving experience, it could be that you want to, experience, you want to change what it's like during the day for a family caregiver. But then you could also think about you know what, but I want to change what it's like at night for a family caregiver, getting up at night, sleepless nights, worrying during the night. So what's disrupting the sleep? What's a solution that you have that will inspire change that gives that family caregiver a better night's sleep? And then it could be that you think, okay, I want to change how a family caregiver looks at the past. It could be regrets. It could be doubts because of what happened that are impacting what's happening today. It could be that they feel like, ah, I should have. I should have done different. I should have done better. So you want to give them a piece about the past. And maybe it's you think, you know what? I really want to change their present. So how they spend their day, how they navigate the systems, how they find help when they use help, why they use help. Maybe you want to inspire a different future, help them save for their own future, make different decisions about their own health care needs in the future. Think about a different career in the future. Maybe you want to inspire change about the money part of the caregiving experience. So Ms. Dre, you talked about how you want to refer family caregivers to veterans benefits. That helps them financially to know that there's a benefit that can help that could pay the family caregiver of the veteran. It could be that you want to help a family caregiver manage the budget for care, manage their budget for yeah. their own needs. It could be that you want to help them find a different perspective. So it's this idea sometimes that you think, gosh, this is like the worst. 
So what's a pivot to a perspective that acknowledges the reality, but opens up for possibilities? You guys also talked about system navigation. And some of you know that I talk about system navigation during the, the caregiving experience as being navigating 17 different systems. So what's a process that could help family caregivers navigate all those systems? What's the process in place to help that family caregiver manage a routine, keep track of the supplies, organize a team? Perhaps it's a change within relationships between siblings who are all providing care for a parent, between a family caregiver and a carry, between a family caregiver and coworkers, if there's some tension around the workplace because a family caregiver is managing caregiving responsibilities too. It could be the relationship the family caregiver has with himself or herself. We are so hard on ourselves. <laughs> How can we give ourselves grace so that we are a little easier on ourselves? Just as an aside, I'm thinking about something I learned the other day, and I've been talking about it regularly. It was a tip on LinkedIn, and it was a coach who helps teenage girls. And her suggestion is at the end of the day to write a do well journal. And you write three things that you did well. Instead of a gratitude journal, or in addition to a gratitude journal, it's also, here are the th three things I did well, that went well. I thought that was an interesting way to close out the day. So that could be something that you create, another type of journaling practice that helps us increase the wellness in our relationship with ourselves. Maybe you want to change the routine. So a family caregiver is trying to figure out, I don't know how to get all this done. I don't know what it is that I should get done. I don't know when it is that I should get all this done. And so you help the family caregiver figure out what's the routine, the routine for care, the routine for themselves, the routine for other family activities, the routine for the workplace. Maybe you're a master at figuring out the routine. And so you want to teach how to create that. It could be that you wanna support the family caregiver around their stress. So I've been doing a stress survey of family caregivers since 2015, and family caregivers rate their stress at 4.12 on a scale from one to five. That number has never been less than 4.12, which says to me that the stress is ongoing and ever present. So if we're constantly in a state of stress, how can you help us have less stress? Perhaps you wanna help that family caregiver connect to support. You wanna lead a support group. You wanna create a supportive event. You want them to feel more supported in their day. Maybe you wanna help them learn. You wanna train them on techniques for hands-on care or a particular disease process like dementia care or Parkinson's or wound care. And finally, maybe it's well-being, their own well-being. Self-care during caregiving is very different than before and after family caregiving. And we often hear that we have to take care of ourselves. And I wanna let you know that that is not helpful because <laughs> we are taking care of ourselves. We are taking care of ourselves. It looks different because it is different. And maybe you just want to change how people talk about family caregiving because you think, you know what, those trite suggestions aren't helpful. I'm going to change the words that are out there around family caregiving. And just as an aside, we changed that with the use of the term care. -y. So when I first started working with family caregivers, I used love one as the term. Then I had this fantastic mentor, Mirka Liberti. She started an organization in the mid-1980s called Children of Aging Parents. And I was lucky enough to live by her. If you can believe that of all the places in the world, I lived near someone who started one of the very first family caregiving organizations. 
and I had an interest in supporting family caregivers. So she became my mentor. And I was driving in a car with her one day and I used the term loved one. And she pretty much put her foot on the, the brake and said, you know, sometimes we care for someone in our family who is not a loved one. So we need to use a term like care recipient instead. From then on, I used the term care recipient until just about 2010, when a member of my community said, you know, I just feel funny calling my mom my care recipient. Couldn't we find another term? And I said, yeah, couldn't we find another term? So I had people make suggestions. I turned those suggestions into a poll and people voted on their favorite and their favorite was carry. And that's why we use the term carry. So it's possible to change language around family caregiving too. Okay, so which of these really resonates with you? How many are we allowed to pick? You. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a limit. So for oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. So for me, it would be well-being of the carry, and also well-being of the veteran, and then training for both because. I care for my husband, but he also cares for me. So he's my carry and I am his carry. Hey, yeah, I like how you've combined it. I think there is pieces that weave together to create a solution. And I think that's what's so fabulous about looking at a list of words like this. Yes, definitely. Corey, what are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking of several because of my OT background, certainly the day, the night, and the present, and the routines would really fit right yeah. in there, because I've already done a ton of that, both for myself and my own caregiving experience, and certainly for all kinds of clients who not necessarily were caregivers of somebody with a physical disability per se, but certainly needed a lot of help. Um, certainly I would want to work with the well-being of the person who is providing the care, which may include perspective, and it also may include process. I mean, that was a huge piece for me was the process of just seeing how it works as a lay person as opposed to a professional. Um, and it was quite eye-opening. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And, and within all of that, I probably can do a certain amount of training. I mean, I certainly can train people on how to use adaptive equipment and how to adjust their routines and, and um, take notes and, and how to take the notes and present it to the doctors in a way that makes sense. So they're not just sitting there sounding like they're complaining and the doctor's kicking them out of their office, you know. Um, so what's interesting is you can focus on providing a service with an intentional outcome without telling the family caregiver you have an intentional outcome, but that's what you hope to create. Oh, okay. right. So if you focus on a process, mm -hmm. it might be that you focus on a process to help that family caregiver find a different perspective about what it's like to go to a doctor's appointment. Mm -hmm. So to move from dread to empowerment. And it might not be that you necessarily tell the family caregiver that. It could be that they realize that. You think that's awesome. That's my intention. Or it could be that that's part of how you describe the service. I want to help you with a process of preparing for doctor's appointments to help you move from dreading to advocating within an appointment. Interesting, okay, thank you. Beth, what do you think? 
Um, yeah, I think process jumped out for me. Um, and I had watched your video the other day where you had said uh, there are 15 systems. <laughs> and then you had a realization that you'd forgotten to. Yes, um, right. Yes, I so added two after I did that. Yes, I kept yeah. adding. Until I told myself to stop. I, 17 was enough. I woke up at two in the morning and realized I left two out. <laughs> um, I think for me, that's where, and and for me, in my experience, but also I went through the transplant process with my husband and you're co cohorted with others, patients and families who are having transplants at the same time. So I got to watch how other people reacted to things as well. And that was the first inkling that it wasn't just me. Um, and to me, it's all these different processes and systems that you navigate as a care partner. See, in Canada, we're now we're evolving language too. care partner um, that causes the stress. And then as you talked about all those other, some of the other aspects that that impacts how um, you might respond if people are giving you unsolicited input <laughs> as to, well, maybe get a pedicure. And it's like, but the better you can understand your own situation and what all those big factors are and learn how to reach out. I think that's what I want to help people with is understand that big picture so that you can, like um, Mr. Rogers said, look for your helpers. Yes. Who do I phone? Who I might be able to call? If I don't know who to phone, who do I know who might know who to phone, right? Because there's so much that a caregiver encounters that you can't predict, because I think everyone's journeys are very individual. Um, but you're still working within that, that the system's so broken, right? Yes. Um, it, yeah. How do you help people to navigate for themselves? And that part of that may be calling you to jump in and give a hand for some paid services, but yes. yeah, I don't know. Yes. I guess I'm not so specific yet as just sort of feeling a bit overwhelmed by all the big possibilities here, I guess. You know, there's another piece of this around language and it's the family caregivers language when they respond to those unsolicited and unhelpful suggestions. We often feel tongue-tied when someone says, gosh, you look so stressed out. Why don't, why don't you just get a massage? If someone, if one other person gives me a certificate for a massage, honest to goodness, I'll be able to open up my own business because it's not, it's not something that is just natural for me to do, but there's other yeah. things that would be helpful. And we are tongue-tied and we feel like, well, I must just accept these even when they're not helpful for me you could help the family caregiver come up with responses that are helpful in communication with family members, with friends, with colleagues. Yeah, because sometimes we are appreciative of the offers of help knowing that they aren't actually helping. Helping, It's mm -hmm. not helpful. And then how do we actually zero in on what's helpful for me how do we articulate it and how do we say it in an easy flowing way so that we can just move on. If someone gives us something that's not helpful, we have a response and then we're just able to move on. We don't stay stuck in, oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying no to this, even though it does not help me. One of the books I wrote is a guide for former family caregivers to help them after caregiving ends. And part of the book is coming up with words to use in unusual circumstances, circumstances that you haven't been in in a while. So you feel awkward. It's empowering right. to think you can show up somewhere and know the words to say, because sometimes we don't want to show up because we think, I don't know how, I think this is going to happen and I don't know how to manage it. So helping someone with the words helps them understand how to manage what could be what could happen. Okay, Jackson, you're on. What do you think? I am half distracted, but. Oh, that's okay. And you can always pass. I'm calling on you just in case you'd like to contribute, but you are welcome to pass. I'm gonna pass. Okay. Curious if there was a word on this list that surprised you guys. Mm -hmm. 
The word for me would be relationships. Oh, okay. And then what did you realize, realize about relationships as we were talking about it? So when I was caregiving in the field to those who were not family members, the relationships became stronger because it was more, it was like I was um, becoming an extension of their family. But then I realized when I was caregiving for my family members, I just started feeling like a burden because they were expecting me to be there and always care give. But then when I got married and I started realizing that myself and my husband were caregiving for each other, it actually strengthened our relationship. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. What can you do to strengthen and what happens that could weaken? The, yeah. So, and I've also noticed, so a lot of people, uh, this was one thing, it was kind of like a deal breaker for me to be married. I didn't want to continue on with my health care without my husband knowing what was happening. So I would take him to my doctor's appointments with me. And then I started going to his doctor's appointments with him. So now we make our appointments uh, like with our family physician together. And then we go to each other's appointments. So we know firsthand the information that we're receiving because sometimes um, patients don't relay everything. And sometimes doctors use medical terminology rather than layman's terms. Yeah, that is a fabulous definition of a team. I think well-being was a word that surprised me because as you had said earlier, when people would say to me, you have to take care of yourself, I was ready to strangle them because I felt like saying, and in what time? Who's going to take care of my husband while I'm taking care of myself by taking, you know, it's like, there's no time for me to do this. You know, and it wasn't like they were offering to sit with him for an hour so that I could you know, take care of me or whatever. Or, you know, if he's keeping me up all night, how is that going to be taking care of me, kind of? So I like the change of the well-being as opposed to taking care of yourself or self-care. Yeah, I intentionally didn't put in self-care, it looks like. Yeah, yeah, I do like well-being better than self-care. But to piggyback off of What's your tip again? Who just spoke? Corey. 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 Okay. So to piggyback off of that. So I am a massage therapist by trade. And what I learned was, you know, we always use self-care. Even when I was in the field, they would say, you know what? Take care of yourself. If you can't pour into yourself, you can't pour into another. And I understood that. So when I was in the field, being an extension of my consumer, um, I would always set up times where I could find someone like another worker or um, a friend who could fill in for me to just get like maybe an hour or so to myself. But then I was also a student. So I was going to school and I was working in the field um I was burning my candle at both ends of the stick but again like I said when I when I was the extension of a consumer I was able to figure out how to make time for myself when I was an extension of a family member uh it got a little different got a little dicey because they thought that 
I was being selfish. Mm -hmm. But like I told them, if I'm being selfish, when I get sick, are you going to take care of me? And I never got the right answer. So I had to learn how to, um, I would pay people when I was taking care of family members. Please, I'm willing to pay you for your time to sit with my grandmother or my aunt or even my mom or my dad. I'm willing to give you money so I can just get a hot minute <laughs> to myself. And, it, and I might not have even left the house. I might have just went upstairs to take a shower. But I needed that time. And it's sad that I had to pay somebody to help me with a family member where I was able to set up something for my own consumers. So I was, it, it felt like a battle, but yeah, I was always taught the word, the, the phrase self-care because well-being, um, it, I don't know, it had a different ring when I was like full-fledged into the community. There's another term that people will say to us, and it's this idea we have to put our oxygen mask on first. Yep. And here's why I struggle with that. So it's this idea we're on a plane and something happens and all the oxygen masks drop. And so we put our, ours on first before we assist another. On a plane, there's an oxygen mask that drops for everybody. So I'm not worried about whether or not I'm going to find an oxygen mask for who's sitting next to me and needs my help because there's one right there. I just reach and put it on. In right. caregiving, we don't have enough oxygen masks for everyone. No, and that's don't. why it gets challenging because we're always trying to figure out, okay, who gets my time? Who gets the resource? Who gets their needs met? Because I don't have enough time, energy, resources, days, ideas, solutions for everyone. All right. So it's it's different in caregiving than it is on a plane, because we don't have enough oxygen masks drop in front of us during caregiving for everyone. Very true. Okay, how does everybody feel about moving on? from this slide. I hope this is giving you some good ideas and some structure to think about as you as you think through your ideas. Yeah. Because now we're just gonna quickly talk about what's the form it becomes. So you have an idea of the change. You have an idea of specifically, what do you wanna change? How do you change it? Is it a book? Is it coaching services? Is it a podcast? Is it a program that you launch? Is it a product? Is it a service? Is it a social media campaign? Is it a website? Is it workshops? Is it a combination of two or three? So you have this passion for impacting change. You get specific about the change that you want to create, and then you move into what's the form to create the change. And then you could even get more specific. So for instance, let's say you decide, okay, it's a podcast or it's a video series. And then you decide specifically, what does it tackle? Is it you offering ideas about a process? Is it you interviewing others about their process? <laughs> is it then a website that people go to after they watch the podcast to download worksheets around their process? I, I read an interesting profile yesterday about a young woman. She's not a family caregiver, but she started a business because she was having a difficult time with her finances. And so she decided to do that very old fashioned but effective technique of using envelopes to stash money in envelopes based on <laughs> what that was needed for. So each envelope had a different purpose. So she started stuffing her envelopes. And within a short period of time, she realized she had saved $1,000, which she had never done before. So then she started going on TikTok to talk about how she was using envelopes 
to change her Mm -hmm. financial situation. And then when she went on TikTok and started getting some followers and interest, she realized that people wanted more than just a white envelope. So she started creating products for stuffing (laughs) cash. And then she started creating worksheets, other types of products that help you manage your budget. You can see how this moves into, yeah. Yeah, she had an idea. It worked for her. She went out into the world to share it because she wanted others to know it works. She listened to what her followers were saying. She realized I could create products because people want them. And then they say she's on track to make a million, to sell, um, to generate revenue of a uh, million dollars this year. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Okay. So what do you guys think about the form that your solution takes? Actually, the form that my husband and I are using, we're doing, we're getting ready to start our podcast. And then um, we've done a talk and we hit three specific points. So we talked about um, healthcare, medicine, and exercise. Um, because veterans, a lot of them, they're still in that mindset of, you know, keeping their routine, exercising, um, staying in shape, uh, keeping their medical kind of private. And, um, when they exercise, you exercise alone because they don't have that team but um so I was I'm learning the lingo but at the same time I'm talking to spouses so I'm saying okay if we're going to be the support of our veterans we're going to exercise with them so they're going to motivate us and we're going to motivate them if we're going to be on the same team for health we're going to go to appointments together. We're going to talk about the medications that we take and why we're taking them. Um, also eating. Um, people don't eat together anymore, which is kind of sad. But like my husband and I, um, we can split a meal. Uh, I'm a vegan. And he used to be a meat and potato guy, but he's kind of uh, backed off from the meat and potatoes because he says he wants to be leaner and healthier and he's lost um, over 75 pounds and I've lost over 40 and we are both recovering from surgeries so we've been um, kind of one hand in hand how to make changes and keep the changes going Uh, Through the podcast, we're going to uh, start talking about how the being a veteran and being a, because my husband is a retired veteran, um, how services are different for a retiree than it is for a like four, six, eight, ten, you know, year veteran Um, retirees. They get a few more benefits, but a lot of people won't go and find out what the benefits and the services are because they don't want to go to the VA. They say that the VA is not good, but we're trying to get people to understand those are services that you actually deserve. You sacrificed your life. So um, what we're also trying to get people to understand is 
if you don't want something done at the VA, you have a social worker, you have community care, and you have a doctor and a nurse on that team, you can ask that team to outsource your care and they'll give you a referral to a doctor outside of the VA, but then they'll keep in contact with each other so that your care is moving forward and you hope and pray um, the ball doesn't get dropped. But if it does, that's where we're starting to let people know. It must be your own advocate. Yeah. If you can advocate yeah. for you, who is going to advocate for you? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to start moving us a little more quickly. I apologize. We just have about eight minutes left, but I want to mention something else. If you're also thinking about how the change will be delivered, you could also think about facilitating meaningful conversations because in a caregiving okay. situation, it's very difficult to have a meaningful conversation about the reality of your life. So one of our yeah. consultants actually leads a unhurried conversation about grief, and it's not necessarily grief around death, it's grief around loss. So she's made a little bit of a differentiation around the conversation. So facilitating conversations is another way to make the change. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just want to quickly tell you about the training programs, because really what we do is create change through the program that you take. So there's five of them I'm going to talk about really quickly. The Advocate is the lowest priced program. And I think Maybe Corey and Beth, you've been through the advocate program. It's just about $29.95. It's a one hour yeah. archived video. I lead you through a process to help you figure out what's the change I want to make. And then after you take that one hour course, you actually take an exam and the exam isn't about what you learned. It's about what you're going to do with what you learned. And that's a really low priced program. If you're thinking, I wonder what it's like to go through a training program with Denise the advocate training would be a great option. And again, that's just about 30 bucks, 29.95. And then we also have facilitator programs that help you if you wanna launch a support group. We often hear people say, I don't wanna to go to a support group. It's all about problems. We teach you how to facilitate a meaningful uh -huh. conversation within a support group. And we have two facilitator programs, one's for family caregivers and one's for former family caregivers. We also have a master caregiving facilitator program to help you with both. If you think I want to do caregiving support groups, I want to do grief support groups. Mm -hmm. And then if you're interested in having a small business while you're still in a caregiving situation, we have the specialist program and that's 400 bucks and you become a personal assistant for family caregivers. So as someone who has a small business, someone who's been in a caregiving situation, I think I need a coach and I need a virtual assistant. And the specialist is the virtual assistant. And it's a way for you to make a little bit of money, set your own hours while you're in a caregiving experience. And that's 400 bucks. It takes about 10 hours to go through that program. Then we have two coach programs, one for after a caree starts palliative care. It's a little different than death doulas. Oftentimes you think about a death doula as starting when hospice services start. My perspective is that that's too late. We wanna start helping that family caregiver with end of life issues yeah. when palliative care starts. So yeah. that's the comfort care family coach. And that's 2000 and that takes about 40 hours. You complete modules that are archived, and then you join me for eight hours of live training to practice the skills, to practice planning sessions. In both of these coach programs, you leave with planning tools that you can deliver as a service that family caregivers pay for. And we teach you how to actually deliver those planning sessions. The goal after both coach training programs is that you have services in place to immediately start charging, that you've practiced during the training so that you are confident when the training ends to go out and start coaching family caregivers. And then our other program, which is the very first program that I launched in 2016, is our Certified Caregiving Consultant Program. And I think of that as someone who is a caregiving ologist. You have studied the caregiving experience. 
you go through the six caregiving stages, the 12 different caregiving fatigues, the 17 caregiving systems, and you learn how to support family caregivers throughout that entire journey. And again, you leave with five different planning tools, including how to help families with their own family emergency plan. And then if you wanna take our six stages workshop out into your community or to a conference as part of a event or by offering it virtually, then you can become an educator. There is a requirement before you become an educator and that is the completion of our consultant training. I give you a turnkey program. I teach you how to deliver it and actually, for our consultants, the ones who do the best actually are because they're an educator. So one of our consultants who finished last year has done probably five or six different presentations using the caregiving experience, including at a, an event that had a hundred people. And she did it pretty soon after she became certified because she was that mm. comfortable and confident. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just as an aside, I want to let you know that we also have an awards program. So if you feel like, you know what, I already have a program that's pretty darn good, you can submit a nomination for your program in the Caring Awards. And for this particular call for nominations, we are honoring a caring leader, a caregiving program, a grief support program, and you can submit a nomination until and through May 26th. There's a $10 nomination fee that we use to fund our family caregiver relief program. Okay, I went pretty quickly through that because I wanted to finish on time, but I want to let you know that we do have a coupon code that you can use through April 7th, and it's good on any of our programs, including our master classes, which I didn't tell you about, but I will in just a minute. So the coupon code is SPRING and you can save 15%. If you're still thinking, what is it really like to go through a training program with Denise? Am I gonna really learn something that I don't already know? We have bundled four masterclasses. Ooh. It's $179, it's six hours of work. You can use spring to save 15%. And those four masterclasses are the six caregiving stages, the caregiving fatigues, the family caregiver's house of cards, and the 17 caregiving systems. That gives you a great insight into my concepts and theories around the family caregiving experience. After you complete those four classes, you complete an evaluation form, and then you get a coupon code to save $500 on any of our coach training programs. So if you're on the fence and you think maybe go through the masterclass bundle, completing that will also save you $500. If you think I'm ready to go to the next level, I want to do comfort care family coach, or I want to do certified caregiving consultant, you'll spend, you'll save 500 bucks with a coupon that you earn. Okay. What do you think? <laughs> Beth gave it a thumbs up. Oops. Yeah. Yeah. Corey gave it a thumbs up too. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. Okay. Great. You guys are all giving me a thumbs up. That's awesome. No, I'm thinking of doing the bundle first because when I read, um, I had to move. My cleaning person is here and she's vacuuming and I couldn't hear some of this. Because <laughs> um, when I read through, your websites on the different things, I was really confused on some of them. It seemed like there was some overlap. It also seemed like I might have some of those skills, but it was like I had skills in each one of the categories, not like one. I could say, okay, this I really don't know. I could take this one. Um, so I was thinking that this might give me a good overview to then know which one to go for. Although from what you described, Right now, I was kind of thinking of the either the um, comfort care family coach or the certified caregiving consultant, one of those two. Yep. And the comfort care family coach is a special 
a specialty. It's really okay. around palliative care into hospice care and then after. Okay. okay. We have three different levels of training related to the consultant training. So the bronze is just the consultant training. And then we package some additional support, coaching calls with me, additional support from our mentors and package consultant, educator, and facilitator. And that's the silver level. So you get a little break on doing all three and then you will receive additional support, coaching with me, access to our mentors and additional support around marketing. And then if you wanna go for the gold, if you think I am ready uh -huh. to write my book, I wanna launch a workshop that's been approved for CEUs and I want to be a consultant, a master caregiving consultant. I want to really deliver an, an exceptional experience with my clients. You would become a master caregiving consultant and then a caregiving educator and a caregiving facilitator. And then you work more closely with me around the programs that you're going to launch. Mm. So when you look at the consultant training, there's three different options. There's just the basic, we call it the bronze. That's just the consultant. And then if you think, but I really want to do support groups and I really want to become an educator too, then you can go to the silver level and you'll get all of those plus a little more support and you save. And then if you want to go for the gold, you want to be a master, that's an option. I should mention that we have payment programs with both the Comfort Care Family Coach and the Certified Caregiving Consultant Program. With the consultant program, you can pay off in 12 months, in six months, or all at once. And with the Comfort Care Family Coach, I think it's all at once or over four payments. If later today you're like, wait, what do I want to do? You can, send, <laughs> you can send me an email and we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation where we get a little more specific about what you want to do and I can offer some guidance. One of the things that I like to do is to actually offer guidance and something that I, I will never do is sell you into something that you do not need because that's not helpful. Mm. I'm very glad you said that because I've looked at other programs and they'll sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. You know. Yeah, what's the point? What's the point? You get frustrated, no. you get aggravated, right. and you think, wait a right. minute, what am I investing my time and money in? I want you to invest your time and money so that you actually use the program in your work. That's right. That's success. Mm -hmm. That's success. If you think, I'd rather go step by step. I want to start with the consultant and see what happens. You could just start with the consultant training and then in six months say, okay, I think I do want the educator. And then you can get a little bit of a break on the educator training. So you can do it program by program, or you can save a little bit if you want to go to the silver or gold. So the silver or gold, do those encompass the coach, comfort care, family coach, or the certified caregiving consultant, or are they separate? So the silver includes the certified caregiving consultant, caregiving facilitator, and caregiving educator. Plus you get coaching calls with me, coaching calls with our mentors, and additional support around your marketing program. Okay. We also include in our silver level, a Gallup's Strength Finder. And I went through that probably 12 years ago and I still remember what my strengths were. And so if I'm always like, well, wait, what do I do? And I think, well, what are your strengths? Mm -hmm. So you complete the assessment and then one of our consultants walks you through a one-on-one -on -one coaching call to help you turn those strengths into a successful business. So how do you apply the strengths that you have Ooh. 
and to your business. And that's included in the silver and the gold level. Okay. And the gold level is master caregiving consultant. So you are required to do more for certification. That's where you really deliver an expertise and an exceptional experience to your clients. You write a book. I help you with that. And you develop a program that's been approved to provide CEUs. So I have a CEU provider. I deliver a lot of CEU. Corey, you know, you've been to a lot of my CEU yeah, programs. Right, yeah. You do the same thing. And that's just a different way to make some money when you have CEU approved workshops. And so we work through to create that workshop with you. And you know what? I apologize. I have another call in three minutes. So I would be happy to, do you want me to tell you what my, oh, there's my email address. So <laughs> you can call me. Uh, do you want me to say it out loud? Is that easier? You can send me a text. And that is 773-343-6341. You can okay. send me a text and say, I want to talk. It all sounds good. I just want it to sound good for me. What does that look like? And then we can get in on a phone call and figure out what does it look like for you? If you're ready to go, you can enroll at careyearsacademy.com and use the coupon code SPRING through April 7th and you'll save 15%. Okay, this was fabulous. How fun was this? Thank you guys so much. Okay, so reach out with any questions. Thank you so much for your interest. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, there we go. Yeah, thank you all for all you do. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was a nice way to spend a Friday afternoon. Thank you guys yes. so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. I look forward to being in touch. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank okay. you. Very Have much. a good weekend. Okay. Bye bye. Bye, people. Bye.